few of the companies that I've been working with have been in this testing stage, have just been, you know, potentially still just drop shipping a product before they work out that it's worth uh, pursuing and then getting manufactured themselves. And it's been an amazing way for them to be able to create native platform, native content at scale. So they've used influencer marketing more so as a content generation machine. So rather than, um, you know, paying a photographer to do a shoot or, you know, just getting your friends to like create video content for your brand or something, influencers are really, really skilled content creators. And one way that you can do it, um, at least a few of them that have been using Hay to do it, has they've been creating just product for content posts. So rather than a product for post, uh, where you'd gift an influencer your product and they'd post on it in return, you gift the influencer the product that you're testing out and then they create whatever type of content, like say, whether that's video content or, you know, still imagery, whatever else, gifts, um, memes, whatever you want created for your brand. And it's and because they're recognisable figures as well at the same time, that social proof element is able to really, really help in kind of that content creation stage as well, being able to, you know, tag the influencers in and kind of whether you do end up paying them to promote that to their audience as well and being able to kind of, you know, at least on Facebook, retarget to that audience too. Hello and welcome to a very special episode of our e-commerce all-star secrets podcast series uh, hosted by me, Eric Dick, the robust marketer, CEO of iStack Training. Um, this is the first interview that we're conducting outside of our Shopify mastermind in Atlanta. We, we filmed a series of, uh, of glossy interviews with, uh, uh, with some of our all-star secrets participants. Um, but unfortunately, um, Greta wasn't able to make it to Atlanta. And, uh, and she lives in Melbourne and I live in Victoria, so it's a, a good 30 hour flight or so. So we decided to conduct this interview uh, over Skype, uh, where I do most of my interviews and uh, thinking, of course, knowing that all the content uh, and the valuable information that Greta was going to share with us would be the same whether we were in person or not. So uh, Greta Van Riel, if you don't know her, you, you probably do is uh, an incredible entrepreneur. Over the last five years, she's grown five multi-million dollar brands in the e-commerce space. Um, two of them are eight-figure brands, performance masterpieces, uh, Skinny Me Tea, and the Fifth Watches. She scaled these companies to incredible heights. She recently had an exit from the Fifth Watches, and she's now working uh, on an influencer marketing agency. She is a, a, a foremost leader in the world of influencer marketing, and that's what she's here to talk to us about. Welcome to e-commerce All Star Secrets, Greta. How you doing? Good, Eric. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. So this is the first time I've had you on the show. So why don't you give us your marketer's hero's journey? Tell us your story in a in a two minute sort of nutshell about how you got to where you are today and what got you started. Oh, good. A two minute nutshell is okay. Sometimes people ask for like a a thirty second nutshell, and you're like, it's not possible. It's too, too small um, a nut. So I started my first e-com startup, Skinny Me when I was 22. Uh, that was in 2012, uh, and that scaled quite quickly. We actually we started around the same time as brands started joining Instagram. So we were kind of one of the first brands actively using Instagram marketing, and then down the track actively using influencer marketing through Instagram to grow our brand. So kind of as Instagram was achieving that explosive growth, we were achieving similar, well, not similar growth to Instagram, no, um, but we were achieving a lot of growth through the platform at the same time. So basically all of our marketing, at least for the first year of the company, was all organic marketing. We didn't have any ad spend. We did no Google, no Facebook just Instagram, just influencers, and we grew from uh, obviously nothing to doing 600,000 US dollars a month in six months. So that was pretty exciting for like definitely the first thing I'd ever done like that. I was 22, I came from a family, like my parents are both social workers. Uh, it was just a very different kind of background to 
some, um, and I didn't really have any experience in anything business or entrepreneurial, and so I learned a lot of really big lessons along the way. Um, but so that's where it started, and then I moved on to co-founding the Fifth Watches. Uh, we had great growth as well. Our first day of sales was a um, hundred thousand dollar day, and a year later, on our first birthday, we did a million dollars in a day. And I think what were we chatting about the other day? I think like two hundred thirty-two thousand dollars of that million dollars was in one minute. How do servers even handle that? That's that's unbelievable. Uh, that you're able to build up that level of anticipation and scarcity to, to make that happen. We'll get into that in a little bit. And um, and you know if you're if you're hearing this interview, then you will also get access to uh, Greta's amazing case study that she produced for us, um, where she details exactly how she how she did this. So um, that will be coming soon. So now the skinny me tea thing. When did you know? Like you said, so it was your first month a six hundred thousand dollars? Your your first month was a six figure. Oh, month? Six months. In, we were doing six hundred thousand dollars a month. If we did six hundred grand in our first month, I would have been like, "What is this?" We were still manufacturing the tea ourselves, like mixing it by hand, sending it out from my house. Like it was very, very grassroots still at that stage. Even six months later, I didn't know how to do anything. I remember going to my first ever meeting. It was with an accountant. He's like, "What are you doing?" And I was like, "I have no idea. I just know how to sell tea." I don't know how to do any of the other stuff. Just help me, please. <laughs> and and so your first move when you you sort of decided, okay, I'm gonna get into the into the this tea this tea movement. I know it can help people. I know it can be a good product. I know how how I can brand it. Was what like was one of your first steps to go out and find a series of influencers who you know this 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 might have resonated with? Well, actually, we kind of stumbled across influencer marketing in a way. So a girl from Tasmania bought a pack of our tea and posted it to her Instagram and she had a thousand followers and back then a thousand followers was an influencer basically and we achieved our best day of sales ever when she posted on the tea so I was like well <laughs> this is easy every time I see somebody that has over a thousand a thousand followers and like is in our demographic you know like similar like basically age group to myself I was basically just marketing to me I was like, well, I like my tea. Um, <laughs> so therefore, you know, and my friends like the tea. So, you know, young, pretty educated, health conscious girls, uh, millennial kind of girls were our demographic. So every time I saw a girl like that, I'd screenshot them and then I'd just comment on their latest photo being like, I'd love to send you some tea. Could you let me know your email address? There was no DMs on Instagram then. So <laughs> it just had to be a comment. Yeah. But because it was so uncommon and especially on Instagram as a platform, maybe there was a bit of influencer marketing going on with YouTube and stuff at that point. But on Instagram, these girls were like, uh, I get free product because I have a thousand followers. Yeah, sure. I'll, <laughs> I'll try your tea. Um, and so like 90% of people would just like write back or 95% of people. I don't really remember many that would write back and say, no, thanks. Like everyone would be like, yeah, sure. Cool. Um, and they'd post and we'd continue growing like that. And as, you know, as people's reach kept expanding and as our pages reach kept expanding, we had about 200,000 followers at the end of 2012, which to be relative, I think like in 2012, Justin Bieber had 400,000 followers. So <laughs> we were a relatively large page for Instagram back then. Um, and we were driving all of our sales through there and kind of interacting with customers at all different kind of stages of the buyer journey and stages of the funnel as well. So it was from like, you know, the awareness stage through to the purchase through to like retaining them as a customer and, you know, keeping them involved in the brand and cross selling and upselling. So it was kind of an interesting way to apply like an e-com funnel to a social platform. Yeah, that, that is really interesting. And I, and I imagine and it's kind of a neat product too. It's like versus a, you know, a T-shirt or an article of clothing, maybe where where an influencer will post about it one time. You you know, the way your product was designed, it was to send people on a journey in a way, right? Because it it's a it's a how long of a process, a thirteen day progress or something, or yeah, yeah. where you're going through it. And so these people would be posting about it time over time, probably as and and they were probably getting results from it as well. Yeah, well, 
that was the great part too because they would keep posting because they were seeing great results as well. So I think it was the fact that the product worked as well as, you know, the marketing around it that meant that customers kept coming back. Yeah, it, it had a strong brand story, right? That's something I hear time and time again. Um, that that that's really important to grow grow brand equity and grow things over time like that. So let's talk a little bit about how much how influencer marketing has sort of changed uh, since uh, since those early days when you were the uh, you know you you were able to just you know everyone loved your product they jumped on it right away. I, I imagine the core principles are similar, but what are some key ways that things have changed? To, to make influencer marketing work for e-commerce people today? Yeah, well, I mean, it's changed a lot, of course. So, I mean, back then, consumer education for whether an influencer was posting, uh, like, branded content or their own content was a lot lower. So consumers are becoming kind of increasingly educated, of course, um, on being able to identify between, like, natural organic native platform content so just natural influencer generated content and influencer generated content that they're creating for brands so you know with that awareness it means that there's an increasing kind of importance on not just influencers ability to you know post beautiful content and command attention but to be able to sell on top of that to be able to persuade like persuasion and influence obviously go hand in hand. So it's that persuasion factor on top of, you know, the content on top of the relationship that they're building with their audience. If, you know, you can't close a deal, it's never, you know, going to happen. So at the same time as them being, you know, a great kind of brand awareness tool, um, they also need to kind of increasingly have that ability to kind of persuade and close. Uh, so, that has been one way that influencers have kind of changed or adapted toward this. Before, they could honestly just post the product, get it out there, people would see it and be like, oh, this influencer genuinely, you know, enjoys this brand. Like, they're giving me, you know, basically one-on-one -on -one advice saying, like, I recommend this. And people just don't see it in the exact same way today. But there's still so many ways to make it so successful for your brand and there's still so many brands that i see every single day with my influencer marketing platform um succeeding in that way so just some ridiculous results one of my friends brands recently bought a 500 dollars post with someone who used to be on the bachelor in australia the post cost them 500 dollars. they made twenty thousand dollars in attributed sales so i mean there's these huge like that's what i don't even that's like four thousand percent roi or something like unbelievable and, and, and so what's the secret to finding those those matches made in heaven like what's the what's the real what it, was that a you know it was that a branding awareness post was that a sales related post like what are the what are, what are the key elements that go into creating uh you know a viral a campaign that has that sort of viral 10x times roi yeah, I mean, it's always difficult, but it comes down to, I mean, once you start getting the types of influences that do work for your brand, it's easy to kind of repeat again and again, but it's there's a bit of testing to kind of find where that ground lives. And a lot of people get put off or disheartened during that testing process, and then they're like, influencer marketing's not for me. Uh, but if you can kind of find that right relationship and that's usually the best kind of factors are in terms of brand and influencer alignment um so one way that i like to put it as a formula is influencer uh, like influence equals reach so an influencer's following and engagement times relevancy so you know their area of expertise or niche that they're in times relationship and their relationship with their audience and there's you know in influencer marketing like any marketing there's kind of there's a mix of metrics and like I put them I call them like hard metrics or soft metrics so like hard metrics are your kind of quantitative metrics that are like okay it had you know the influencer has 200,000 followers they get 3,000 likes on a post, like whatever else. A lot of brands get very distracted by these exact metrics, but it's actually the softer metrics, so the more qualitative metrics that form the best relationships. So it's actually 
you know, things like the way that their audience has, like the emotional connection their audience has with them. And of course, those things are very hard to quantify. But if you look for kind of the right indicators, you're kind of able to succeed in that way. So I think that it's really important not only to look at, you know, not just to get distracted by being like, oh my God, Kim Kardashian has 100 million followers. I want her to post my brand. Like she may not, she is a very debatable case as well though. She may have, like, she has a great relationship with some of her followers. They've watched her on TV for years. Like, some of the younger followers have basically grown up watching her show, yeah. however appropriate that is or not. And <laughs> yeah. uh, at the same time, people know that she actively promotes, you know, brands and products that she probably doesn't use. She's got a credibility issue. While at the same time, she's got, she still has somewhat of a relationship with her followers. So it, she's a tough one, but it's And a, she's so big that she overcomes I, a lot of that, right? Like, you know, she, she, like you say, there's different segments of these people's followers as well. So like, and, and I, yeah. and she'll make it up in volume in a lot of cases, I'm sure, but her costs would be just astronomical. Yeah. Something like $300,000 a post on Instagram. It's not bad work if you can get it. That's, no. uh. That's incredible. So, so, so these soft, so how do you go about assessing these soft metrics? Like it really, is it really an eye test? Is it really like you really have to go in there and make sure that there's meaningful conversation happening, that they're affecting people on an emotional level or what are some ways you go about that? Yeah. So I like to kind of just set some different indicators that I can look at and kind of go through a bit of a list in a way of ways that, you know, things you might, I guess, overlook. Um, so, but in terms of their relationship with their audience, um, a lot of it comes down to obviously communication and the way that they're able to speak to their audience in the language that their audience already knows and trusts. And it's a two-way street as well. So a lot of the influencers that have the best relationships with their audience are consistent. They show up all the time. Uh, they might even do, you know, kind of real life events and stuff where they meet up with the audience, you know, they go to events, they do those meetups and people like swarm them kind of like when they're posting things like that, you know, how engaged their following is in that way. When they're following, are asking them actual, real questions rather than just being like pretty, that's lovely, amazing. Those sort of generic comments mm. don't, you know, they don't equate to much. So, but if people are like, you know, where exactly did you get, you know, for a mummy blogger or something, where exactly did you get that pram? What did you do when your baby was crying up all night? Like blah, blah, blah. And if they actually interact back with that audience, so that two-way communication is so, so valuable. And if you can see that an influencer does that and they're going to represent your brand in that way as well and jump in and answer questions when somebody's like confused about it, because it's not just the post. It's the way that you then engage them upon the post. It's kind of the campaign support uh, that the influencer can offer as well. So, I mean, one option is, you know, paying them a little bit more so that they are around after they do post and saying, like, I want an hour of your time to interact with your followers as they're asking you questions. It's not just thinking of it like a get in, get out, like, okay, I've just bought. It's not an ad. Like, you didn't buy. If you want to... To buy an ad, it's a lot cheaper just to buy an ad that's going to be seen by, you know, 200,000 people sometimes. Yeah. Well, it's debatable. You can, it, there's ways that you can do it. But, um, yeah, so basically it's just trying to work with influencers who do have that really kind of engaged relationship with their audience. Um, and I will go through a few more of those factors um, in some more content that I create with you guys soon. Yeah, nice. We can we can tease that a little bit. Where, uh, you know, obviously the e-commerce all star secrets uh, series that we're producing is going to culminate in a uh, in a, a free course that we're producing with several of these amazing uh, all stars that we're working with, and Greta is going to be handling the uh, the influencer marketing component of it. So let's talk a little bit about. Uh, you know, just getting started with it. You know, I, we just did this big survey. We did we we surveyed 500 uh, e-commerce professionals, and we asked about you know where their focus was. And of the 500 people, like it was still uh, you know a large percentage of these people were were still mainly using Facebook ads. Like m mostly, you know, 80 percent of their ad mix was on Facebook ads. And so I think there's just a massive opportunity for people to to get into 
uh, you know, influencer marketing and, and really, uh, really test it out. So what, you know, so take the example of someone who's built a, you know, a, a store, a store and a brand that's essentially selling, you know, branded apparel, maybe some printed, some print on demand stuff, maybe, maybe, you know, a hybrid of, of, of also selling some other products as well. Like not necessarily building a singular company like, like skinny me tea. Cause a lot of our audience are still in that process of, of testing a lot of different products. Like what's it, what's an influencer strategy. So say, but then you, so, so say you find a product that works and you have, you're building a brand sort of around, um, a, a, a niche that, that you're selling this product in your brand associated with it. What's a good first step for people at that stage to, to, to do a really valuable test for influencer marketing? I think even before that stage, while they're still in the testing stage, a few of the companies that I've been working with have been in this testing stage, have just been, you know, potentially still just drop shipping a product before they work out that it's worth uh, pursuing and then getting manufactured themselves. And it's been an amazing way for them to be able to create native platform, native content at scale. So they've used influencer marketing more so as a content generation machine. So rather than, um, you know, paying a photographer to do a shoot or, you know, just getting your friends to like create video content for your brand or something, influencers are really, really skilled content creators. And one way that you can do it, um, at least a few of them that have been using Hay to do it, has they've been creating just product for content posts. So rather than a product for post, uh, where you'd gift an influencer your product and they'd post on it in return, you gift the influencer the product that you're testing out and then they create whatever type of content, like say, whether that's video content or, you know, still imagery, whatever else, gifs, um, memes, whatever you want created for your brand. And it's and because they're recognisable figures as well at the same time, that social proof element is able to really, really help in kind of that content creation stage as well, being able to, you know, tag the influencers in and kind of whether you do end up paying them to promote that to their audience as well and being able to kind of, you know, at least on Facebook, retarget to that audience too. So there's a lot of different ways and I think that it can start at that testing stage in terms of content. Um, and then you're able to move into, as soon as you do have a brand um, or, you know, you do have that focus, um, probably a campaign that I would think of starting out with would be, well, there's, to me, at least on Hay, we say that the four kind of main goals that most brands have in influencer marketing when they're starting out are brand awareness, uh, driving sales, obviously, uh, increasing your social following and content. So if you think about those goals and you think about the campaigns that you're able to run to work backward or reverse engineer from those goals to achieve success, just like in any marketing, I guess. So yeah. if you think about the goal and work backward from that goal to form the strategy, then you're able to kind of see the different types of campaigns that you can run. So for a brand awareness campaign, which is often a really good starting point for a brand, it could be sending out product at scale for um, gifting to influencers and uh, just literally just a product for post campaign. With content, like we just spoke about, it could be product for content. Uh, and they don't have to post at all. Although sometimes because they've created great content for your brand and they're proud of the content they've created, they end up posting it anyway. Mm. So it's kind of a double win there sometimes. Uh, with growing a social following, uh, giveaways are usually the best kind of way to drive that because they have very clear call to actions in the campaigns. And again, call to actions in any of these campaign styles, uh, you know, they're going to drive results a lot more than not having one. Um, so a giveaway, maybe like a tag to win competition is another really good way to start on that platform. Like you might want to be getting into influencer marketing and into Instagram marketing at a similar time. So you could use your influencer marketing campaign to kind of explode the initial growth of your account. So for example, one of my friend's brands recently launched, um, it's called Bambi Boutique in New Zealand. Um, and they grew from, they gave away three beauty packs worth $2,500 each. And they worked with three different macro, very macro influencers, like around a million followers each. Okay. But they, that was a large campaign. 
However, they grew from 4,000 to 168,000 followers in one week. So they grew by over 150,000 followers in a week. So I mean, like, people are worried about Instagram thinking, like, it's not a, you know, you're not able to achieve the same results as you used to, whatever else. Like, these examples, while they're not always all that easy to replicate, are an incredible example of the way that you still can explode your growth and it is possible. So if you know something's possible, like, you're, of course, much more likely to push to achieve it. So they're kind of... And then with a sales generation campaign, a really good way to just test out whether influencer marketing is working for you and test things like diminishing returns if you're purchasing multiple posts um, is just creating unique personalised discount codes for the influencers to use with their followers. And then if you can see that it is generating sales and they are bringing in you know, revenue for your company, you can see that that's worth reinvesting in. Very cool. And now, now to track this, you're just basically you're mainly using UTM parameters in the in the links in the bio. Is that accurate? Yeah. So there's a few different tracking techniques. I mean, obviously the discount codes are one way that you can yeah. track. I would say for each one of those that we just spoke about. So for each goal, so content, following, sales, um, and brand awareness, you can come up with your own KPIs and tracking metrics for each. Um, so. I mean, content is kind of an obvious one to track, like how many pieces of content are being created, what kind of quality that content is of, and often I measure that quality on how many times I end up repurposing that content. So if I use it across like my Instagram on a Facebook ad on my website and in EDM, that obviously was, you know, a really good quality post. Um, so there's kind of, it's, a bit difficult. I know that influencer marketing is one of the kind of harder um, and just like social ROI is harder to track, but there are a lot of different ways. So yeah, with UTM parameters for links um, and retargeting to those really engaged audiences, which converts really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, or um, yeah, using personalized discount codes uh, are two of the kind of main ones and just keeping an eye on all your metrics. So some other things like seeing that, okay, now you've just released a campaign on Instagram for influencers, the percentage of your referral traffic that's now coming from Instagram, for example, the percentage of your referral traffic that is converting from Instagram is that higher than other platforms, you know, are these leads, you know, potentially warmer than other leads coming in. So if you just keep a good eye on like, your metrics as a whole and you understand where your brand's at, tracking isn't as scary as it seems. And again, with things like impressions and whatever else, like they don't necessarily mean as much. I'd rather track, I call, you know, they're more vanity metrics as opposed to kind of actionable metrics like, you know, real website traffic that you can then retarget to and whatever else. So. I don't worry as much about that, but if you do want that data just to have a look at, usually either the best way is to just simply ask the influencer for a screenshot of the post analytics after they've posted, or to um, share those analytics with you. On Instagram, for example, when it says like, this post is sponsored by Eric, Eric would then get the sharing like you would be shared those insights automatically with you because it's in partnership with you. So there's kind of a few different ways. And yeah, there, the, a lot of the, the, the conversations I've been having recently are about, um, you know, being able to segment your audience effectively and treat them dynamically depending on where they came from and the actions that they take on your site, for instance. So if you can plan, if you're planning a campaign with specific influencers at specific times, then making sure that you're keeping track of those people who come to your site and then following up with with marketing or emailing or just retargeting that references the, the you know the influencer that brought them there as well i imagine tactics like that are going to help move the needle as well yeah definitely i mean that was with the fifth for example we used to do that down to the email that they would get when it became time to shop because the fifth was a bit different we only sold on the fifth of each month for five days so it was that kind of limited exclusive scarcity model um but when they did go to the website, we um, would use the actual image that triggered them to sign up uh, to re-engage them to shop. So 
you know, whether they remembered that image actively or not, they would have, you know, that kind of, there'd be the fam familiar, I can't speak, familiarity bias. <laughs> yeah, the con we always say continuity, right? Like, even if it's subconscious, they would have seen, you know, it would bring them back to that first experience and, exactly. and make it more continuous. So influencer marketing is great like that because you can, you know, it, that sort of stuff is easy to track. Very cool. So um, I'm running out of time here. The sun coming through the window is soon going to be directly in my eyes here. So, but I wanted to talk, we're, I'm super excited to release this case study that you produced with us. Uh, you know, obviously I just came, came from the Shopify mastermind and uh, you know, hearing about what makes viral content. It's like clickbait still works. And when you're able to say something in a headline of a, of a case study about $242,000 in one minute, uh, it's it, it's a pretty powerful statement. So like I can't imagine what it must have been like, uh, you know, refreshing and seeing those numbers go up. Refreshing once maybe you, that you did in that minute when it was happening. But talk about the situation that led to that a little bit. You know, people will get all the details in the case study when they grab that. Uh, but just talk a, a thumbnail sketch about the fifth. It's I think it's such an interesting story. Yeah. Well, I mean, the way that the fifth worked. Uh, as a model and a buying mechanic was interesting. And I think we need to chat about that quickly first before we move into how exactly that happened. So yeah. what would happen is because we only sold on the fifth of each month for five days, uh, the other kind of 25 ish days of the month were just spent in lead generation. So we would just be capturing as many emails. Uh, well, like our funnel was basically like influencer marketing through to our Instagram, then hopefully becoming a follower as well through to signing up to become a VIP or, you know, to the wait list on our website to then purchasing on the fifth. So the way that we, the, the way that we were able to create a really compelling reason for someone to sign up was our website on the fifth was locked with a password. So you had to enter a password that you got via your email to then be able to shop on the fifth. So there was like that very compelling reason to sign up. And because the majority of our signups that we were driving weren't off, you know, things like here's, you know, like a downloadable with like an ebook or something. It was honestly people just actively signing up because they wanted our product. So being that much more kind of specific in our marketing, like, we've done campaigns where, you know, you give something away like a GoPro or something, you get 16,000 signups and it's like a dead list. You may as well not even bother emailing them if you're selling, you know, a watch or something because yeah. people they want the GoPro. It's not necessary. Yeah. The only thing you could do is like maybe give that data to GoPro or something. Uh, I wouldn't bother. So no. it was how warm those leads were uh, once they were signing up. And going through that lead nurturing process from engaging with that influencer that they already, you know, feel like they know and trust to going to our page, then following us, feeling as though they've already, you know, performed some sort of action toward building a relationship with our brand um, to then going to our website and signing up because they like the product and they want what they can't have. <laughs> it was just this really interesting, very different funnel to almost all other companies I've kind of seen. Yeah, it's counterintuitive in a way. We did a similar thing with our last mastermind where we we gated it with a very with like a twenty question you know application to even be able to buy it, and that's not a revolutionary concept by any means. But this sounds like it was. It sounds like you kind of like broke a lot of the rules, and in doing so, created a really cool model. You were saying even the idea of only selling for the first five days was also an accident. Yeah. So. We were called the fifth, um, we were just called the fifth, uh, basically. Alex called me, my co-founder, once we had the idea, and he was like, what should we call the brand? And I was on Fifth Avenue in New York at the time. And I was like, the fifth? I don't know. Um, and then we just stuck on that. We're like, okay, cool, that sounds good. Let's run with it. You know, brand names aren't that important. Like, Uber's called Uber, that means nothing. Well, you know, it means two in German or whatever. Like, okay. too much, too cool, whatever. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so basically we were like, yeah, the 5th, sure. So then we got delivered the watches on like the 2nd of December and we were like, okay, cool, let's get them up and sell them. But it was Alex's birthday on the 5th. And so we were like, that would be a nice birthday present to launch, you know, it was his first brand um, and to do that on his birthday. And also we were called the 5th. So we were like, let's launch on December 5th. And then 
we had a wait list of, I think, about 8,000, around 8,500 signups. Um, and we had 1,200 watches to sell. And we we're like, you know, like we're not going to eight of our database. So we're all good. So we launched and we basically sold out in that day. So then we were like, oh God, like one of my favorite things in marketing, well, there's two here, is turning something that was accidental into something that looked deliberate uh, and kind of, I guess, spinning it in that way and turning a negative into a positive, being like, okay, like it might seem like a terrible thing that we sold out, but actually this is what makes our brand so exclusive and exciting. So we're called the fifth. We only sell on the fifth of each month, but five days or until sold out previously, whether that's five minutes or whatever. So that was kind of the way that the sales model came about by accident. And then you, over a year's time, you're able to build up this model, gain the momentum to the point that the following year, around the same time, you were able to generate that insane amount of cash in uh, in a very short time. How how was it? How was it fulfilling that? Like, have you have ever had issues with the volume of sale sales that you're producing in such a short time to 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 be able to fulfill these orders? No, we were totally fine by then. Like. Uh... Because I'd already had, you know, Skinny Me Tea, for example, and other e-com companies, I knew all the kind of right processes to go through. So we had a really, really good relationship with our um, logistics company, so our third-party logistics company. The watches were shipped straight there. We had enough stock to sell that because we had this model where we'd sell out. Like, we were never going to sell beyond what we could cater to. So basically, like, as we got the sales, we'd ship them out based almost the following day. Um, so that day, yeah, there would have been a lot of watches to ship out for the poor people, but <laughs> they did a really great job. So, And we had a few different kind of logistics points around the world, I guess. So we had, like, one in Australia, we had one in Hong Kong, one in the UK, and one in the US by then. So we were pretty organized ready for it all right yeah very cool so you've now launched you've launched a you've drop bottle on top of this and there's a couple other brands probably as well that you've launched and now you're sort of turning your attention to uh your agency to where you can help kind of leverage these strategies for other businesses you've also done some really cool teaching you did a course with founder you've, you've knocked off a course with uh with shopify and now you're participating in the e-commerce all-star secrets what what about teaching do you love I just, I love the way that, like, I love giving advice. I've always been the first person to, I guess, I don't know if it's putting your foot in it or whatever else. In high school, girls would come up to me and be like, Greta, how do I, you know, lose two kilos in a week? Or how do I, like, do this? Or how do I do this? And they'd come to me because I was always the first person to give the advice. And I give it in, like, a very kind of sure way. Um, So that's when I first knew that I lacked to give advice. Maybe I'm just like nosy or something I like it, Um, but but then yeah I don't know I just I do a lot of startup consulting and a lot of I've done a lot of kind of advisory over the years but I just don't like the way that that's not scalable so sometimes I answer someone's question I give them a really great like paragraph answer in an Instagram DM or something and then after that I'm like oh but no one else can see that Like, Mm. and I get asked that question again and again and again. So it's kind of that way to be able to scale your advisory to that next level and make it so much more kind of democratic. (laughs) Very cool. And it's such a unique new area as well. It's, you know, it's really uh, the Wild West in a lot of ways. Like, I think there's, it it, it reminds me of affiliate marketing back in the day um, where, where people are coming into it and the people who can invent their own protocols or, or learn established protocols from people who've already done this before. It's just going to give people a huge edge. I think people, any, anyone who's building a brand, anyone who's, uh, yeah, who's able to really, um, build out an, an interesting, unique product line. It's just an absolutely indispensable tool. Yeah. a hundred percent. I'm just laughing at, um, your the, son, mustache the son right? just going just higher and higher. Here. Oh boy. I usually do my interviews in the morning and I haven't had this where the, uh, the sun is blazing through like this, but, uh, I think Sorry. so, so I want to announce as I, as I have mentioned that you're doing the e-commerce all-stars, uh, free mini class. What can people expect to get out of your portion? And as I've, as I've mentioned in these other interviews, we have different all-stars tackling sort of each key, um, 
point along the journey of like of great e-commerce success. And the way that we have it organized now, we've got three lessons coming in that are really about how to get started in the game. We've got Nick Peroni and Ben Malal and Dimitri Skadis all talking about starting a store, running some Facebook ads, getting your analytics tight. And then in the second half of the of the free course, we have people coming in with with sort of the skills that can take you to that next level. So we've got Greta doing doing influencer marketing and Nick Shackelford talking about retargeting and segmenting your audience and and adding in some some other Facebook um, scaling tactics. And then Muhammad Ali Agel, who's coming in about single product funnels, really how to drive conversion rate and average order value. So in in your piece, obviously it's going to be about influencer marketing Instagram. But what do you think people will be able to walk away with after your portion of the free course? I think kind of also where mine might differ from others is I am focusing so much just on almost just this single topic of influencer marketing that I'm honestly going to give you every single step from the very start, like from the campaign creation and how to come up with, you know, your goal setting all the way through to finding the right influencers to work with your brand, then how to collaborate, like how to simplify a very like messy collaboration or like campaign workflow. So I honestly, everything, <laughs> it seems weird, but everything I've learned in influencer marketing so far, I don't think there's almost anything I've left out of this. So like I touch on everything that I go through from start to finish. So I think that's the cool part because it's like, it go it's end to end like if you use kind of the way that um if you want to get into influencer marketing and explore it by like going you know from there's only one way to do it with influencer marketing you have to do it in exactly the right order and i'm going to give you that order <laughs> that sounds pretty fantastic uh you can also catch greta of course at e-commerce mastery live in barcelona we're all very excited for our trip to spain uh it's going to be a heck of a good time and so I can't really get a, a terrible sunburn before I get there, so I think I have to leave the studio now. But I want to thank you so much uh, for coming on the on the talk today. I think there's a, a lot of great information here, and I can't wait to, uh, to to release this this free course that's coming out. I can't wait to hear your talk in Barcelona. I think it's going to help a lot of people. Amazing! Yeah, I can't wait either. Thanks for okay. having me, Eric. Yeah, thank you, Greta. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>